Hi guys, uh, welcome to my session on social media for the BDC Digital Academy. Uh, of course, I have my biases, but I'm really proud of this initiative and I'm so thankful to everyone that has contributed to it so far. Uh, growing up, I wish I had access to as much material from local sources as we do now. And I hope with our continued focus on working for the circuit, we'll make sure there's lots of these material um, that will stay with young debaters for years to come. They can always revisit and use. Uh, with that said, let's jump on to the session. Uh, social media has evolved so much. It's such a broad term that when I get asked to take a session on social media, it's hard to narrow down exactly what we want to talk about. Uh, but having spoken to a, a lot of school debaters that I reached out to, uh, the consensus was that the biggest discussion should be around politics and how social media deals with that. So in this session, we'll cover a discussion on politics within social media. We'll also discuss um, some of the origins of social media. Uh, we'll discuss misinformation. We'll discuss uh, targeting. Uh, we'll discuss um, a lot of how social media intersects with politics and what we need to be wa watch out for, what we need to watch out for in the future. Uh, with that said, let's get to the origins of social media. And the world was vastly different in a time without social media. Um, but a lot of companies did want to succeed in the tech space, and they fought ferociously. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a massive war by the brightest minds of Silicon Valley to win over the internet and the, dominate that particular marketplace. They fought on tech, they fought on people, they fought on marketing budget, they fought on finding funding for their companies. But unbeknownst to all of these really sharp people, uh, they were not fighting a war that one particular scrawny sophomore in Harvard was fighting. Uh, that was the war on emotion. And that is a crucial impact as to why Facebook is the dominant social media service today. So see, in that time, the internet largely comprised of three types of main platforms. List-based platforms, where you would come in and rank things. You would rank your professor, you would rank girls on campus. So things like hot or not websites or ranked.com, these were massively popular. Uh, in terms of the closest thing we had to Facebook today, we had MySpace. Uh, MySpace was uh, very popular at that time. Lot, all the cool kids were on it. It was a very decoration-centric site. So you could decorate your page with uh, your favorite music. You could decorate it with a lot of these games and quizzes and all of these things. So people had a lot of control in what their profile looked like. And people were very engaged into MySpace. Uh, in terms of messengers, MSN, Yahoo, and AOL were the primary messengers. And people would use these for you know, personal conversations like we do with Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp today. But at that time, these interactions were primarily based on a computer and not on mobile, which made a big difference in terms of how much time people spent on these platforms, which has significantly gone up now. So in terms of Facebook, Facebook realized there is a scope for emotional investment of people, and that's where the game is. So this is something MySpace or the messengers had not really focused on. They were focused on making sure their users are on that platform and they're sticking around. Uh, but Facebook wanted to do more. Facebook had the mindset that the time the users spend on their platform and the emotions they invest in it, that itself will one day act as a currency which they can monetize. So they, with this vision, they initially piloted a lot of the same features of MySpace, but for a very limited crowd. So initially Facebook, uh, when first developed, was only open to an Ivy League crowd. But as they expanded, uh, Mark Zuckerberg knew differentiation had to kick in. And slowly the evolution started taking place. So MySpace, which was a really bloated website, it would take forever for your profile to load. And there were all these different things stashed into your profile. Um, so he removed all of that. He made Facebook a lot more minimalist and a lot more quicker. It was without a doubt the cleanest and most quickest social media platform available for consumption at that time. And the biggest hook that happened is the introduction of the wall. So what we now know today as the timeline was initially called the wall. So see, platforms like MySpace and High Five, um, there wasn't a lot of interaction available on your profile. So people could leave things like a testimonial or a compliment, or they could give you points and stuff like that. 
But Facebook's wall sort of started becoming conversation people would be doing with each other on the platform. And that was that really acted as a hook. And people started doing it. People started writing and posting on each other's walls and what is now the timeline. Uh, as interaction came in and the demand for interaction built itself on Facebook, they brought in the messenger. Uh, at the same time, Twitter, which started as a microblogging platform and where people were putting out their opinions, Facebook saw that and brought in the news feed. So the news feed, the wall, and the messengers combined to create the ultimate product Facebook is today. And if you note here, these are three things that they've identified from competitors, from competing platforms, and realized how they can connect these three things to solve the emotional gap of people and encourage interaction on their platform. And this would really become Mark Zuckerberg's calling card, identifying features that competitors are using and figuring out how to get these features onto his platform in a way that drives emotion and really makes itself an established part of your life. Uh, this has been done through acquisition, for example, Instagram. Uh, this has been done through adaptation. For example, when Snapchat burst in popularity, you saw Instagram and Facebook also adapting the stories feature, which has soared past Snapchat in terms of its popularity. And this extends to even small companies and niche aspects of our life. So for example, there's a little app called Pocket, which I used to use, where you could save things and articles you see on the internet to revisit later. And Facebook sees the popularity of this burgeoning app and they bring it onto their platform under save feature as well, right? So it's an action, they, it's a deliberate thing they do where they look around to see what people are doing and they make sure they bring that on to Facebook. So whatever emotional investment you are spending on the internet is something that has to be on Facebook. That's a mindset which, in which they operate. And that's why they've grown so much and has really become synonymous with the internet. But as Facebook has grown along with the world of social media, so have many issues of contention. So let's start with one of the most crucial ones, which is politics and discourse. Uh, if you're a platform which thrives on interaction and thrives on emotional interactions, Nothing reels in emotion like politics. So this is something Facebook actively encourages. How do they encourage it? They allow political campaigns and personalities to purchase ads on their platform. And they do this in huge numbers, in millions and dollars and pounds you see spent on Facebook uh, to buy ads. Um, this has trickled down even into countries like Bangladesh where local politicians are making their pages, going live on Facebook, making their theme songs which are going viral. So people are doing all sorts of things on the internet. Uh, at the same time, Facebook amplifies your desire to know more about politics by giving you suggestions. So the second you like a Donald Trump page, it will automatically recommend you a Mike's, Mike Pence page or a Kellyanne Conway page as well, because it figures you're interested in these sort of personalities and personalities align with the same mindset. And it pushes you into that box uh, it pushes you into that box based on your profile and based on your behavior and wants you to live in that world and really feel all of it. Uh, people have foreseen the danger for this. Congress has called in Facebook numerous times and asked them to uh, create regulation uh, to curb down the amount of toxic interactions happening on this platform. But the regulations still remain very lax. Facebook remains extremely reluctant to act uh, in terms of uh, limiting political ads. And they argue that you know, they use free speech as the shield to ensure that these decisions do remain. Because the re regulations are still lax, and at the, at the best case still take a lot of time to implement or are implemented imperfectly, this is taken advantage of quite a lot. So who takes advantage? It's taken advantage of by one individual and two organizations who need the clicks and who realize that through Facebook, their content can be consumed by, like, by a global audience. So they push all of that out there. And we see uh, content which incites a lot of engagement and incites a lot of conversation. So the next step is, what is this conversation like? What does it look like? Um, so in debates, we talk a lot about how generating discourse is a good thing. But I think the evolution of social media has to be taken into account when you run these sort of arguments. And you have to really characterize what this discourse looks like. See, the discourse on social media, even though it's consumed by a global audience, is a discourse which encourages grandstanding. What do I mean by grandstanding? 
By grandstanding, I mean what previously would be a conversation between you and another person is now a conversation between you and the entire world. What that means is everything you type is something people on your profile and people all around are watching. So the girl you want to impress, to your colleague, to uh, someone who you really want to think that you really want to convince you're cool, everyone is watching to see what you type. And that makes you really think a lot about how you're going to perform. So you end up pandering to a lot of different, different uh, subgroups or a lot of different, different mindsets. Uh, and that often means you want to win a conversation. You want the most likes rather than really pushing in the most rational idea. You want to ensure some sort of victory or some sort of populist gain out of that conversation. At the same time, that also means that you don't want to admit defeat. Your emotions rile up and your emotion drives your engagement. And you end up developing a social media persona. So for example, uh, Egg Allah is a social media persona who is communist in nature. And a lot of his content always uh, veers on that front. That means that uh, he has a persona to live up to. And if he shifts from that persona, there is a risk that he will be shamed by people who regularly follow his content. So if he ever wants to shift his persona or go against the norm of his usual content, it's a toxic dichotomy for him whether he wants to do so, which means we encourage a world where changing your mind on an opinion, admitting uh, that your opinion has changed, uh, con considering that there's another side of the coin to consider, a lot of all of these things are more difficult and become more and more difficult to do within a conversation. So if discourse is meant to generate a conversation where opinions can come down to the best middle ground, the current dynamic of social media, which rewards emotional engagement, doesn't really suit that because people are determined to win. And in their efforts to win, uh, things can go haywire. One of the most common things that happens in these sort of commentaries is moral assertions because uh, people start speaking in absolute terms. Things are the best, things are the worst, things are the most horrific or the best thing they've ever seen. What happens when these assertions kick in is that contents become more and more viral because the more stronger your opinion is, the more oomph you put behind it, it becomes more inflammatory and it becomes more iconic and has more and more chance to go viral. And what we see this in terms of uh, things like Fox News, when you compare Fox News with CNN, obviously CNN is objectively more news-centric and more information-centric. But if you look into social media, it's a different world altogether. Fox News' Facebook page has 17 million followers, 80% more reactions, comments, and shares than CNN, which has 31 million followers. So Fox's engagement rate and the average number of engagement per post that it has is more than major news organizations of the same kind and five times as much as a publication like the New York Times. So more intellectual platforms and publications actually lose out because uh, things like Fox really encourage inflammatory and viral content to take precedence. This has, really has a knock-on effect in the media publication world as well because all of these organizations then think that how they should perform in social media is also in the same way of inciting the most reactions rather than pulling and pushing out the most balanced news or the best way or pulling out the most moderate news. So there's a huge mindset shift in how social media news is working today because of things like this happening. That also means that the algorithm of Facebook, and by algorithm we mean uh, the nature in which a news feed is designed, the nature in which a content is promoted to you. All of these things are dictated by the data Facebook collects off of all the user interactions that they're seeing. And when the algorithm starts rewarding uh, emotional and viral content, uh, this is the content that really drowns out any other type of content as well. So even if you publish a really nice uh, workshop or an hour long video or discussion, which is like more intellectual in nature, the chances of that going viral are significantly less than a picture which has an assertion and which has incited a comment, a large number of comments below. And because of that, a lot of the newer online portals, um, whether it's Vox, whether it's Breitbart, whether it's local publishers like BD News 24, all of them are sticking to the strategy of making sure their content is the one that goes viral. 
rather than making sure their content is the most researched or the best content that they can possibly put out there. And this ha has really derailed a lot of the original promises social media discourse showed uh, in its early stages. So in debates, it's important to characterize how discourse has evolved in social media as of now and how publication and media uh, acts in social media in comparison to how it acts in a traditional setting or how it used to act because the game has changed a lot and it's a lot more rewarding of your emotional engagements and people act accordingly as well. Uh, there's also a lot of different ways social media can be manipulated uh, and the algorithm can be taken advantage of to uh, evade a lot of regulations or to make sure that um, it's really, it, that it makes sure that it benefits the publisher more than anyone else. Um, so a click-through rate is the observation of how many people are clicking on your particular content and really sticking to it. And something that has really happened is that the art of distortion, uh, the art of making sure people come to your content and it has really become uh, an art form. It has become something that people are, are experts at. People are being hired by politicians on their campaign staff based on their ability to distort and manipulate information. Um, so, some, the, so an example I can give you is that a politician no longer has to have one opinion. So if Trump feels that his, the way he's given out a message on vaccines would may be well received by one part of his base, but not well received by other, because uh, social media gives a lot of tools to these politicians and these organizations to play with, they do use these tools as well. So you can actually make one, uh, for one central message like vaccines, you can make 20 different ad sets and each ad set can cater to a different subgroup. And each of them may be different for, and each of them are likely to be different from one another. So you, pull out, you put out so much content targeting so many groups and you're trying to get the clicks from all of them. So politicians have the ability to push out a lot of content to a lot of people at once and they can observe the reactions and learn and adapt accordingly. So the so distortion, distorted content coming out isn't a coincidence. Uh, it isn't sporadic, and it isn't organic. It's a detailed, manufactured process which everyone is now adapting, and it's a crucial battle for politicians to win in coming days going forward. But it's not to say that all of social media is bad. There have been iconic moments. The Arab Spring comes to mind. Um, it was primarily uh, organized and mobilized in Twitter. And it's really one of the first examples of the internet being used uh, in such a massive way to overthrow dictatorial regimes across Egypt, across Tunisia. Of course, the uh, results of the Arab Spring uh, have been very debatable, but there is no denying that the existence of social media allowed those protests to catch fire uh, the way they did. Uh, and it's still one of the best examples of how, how quickly people can mobilize and create tangible uh, political action uh, through social media. One of the more broader examples is the birth of call-out culture in itself. Uh, because social media is such an instantaneous mode of communication and because so many people are watching, you can't call out a behavior that you find problematic directly. Uh, we have seen... Uh, the role social media has played in amplifying things such as the Me Too movement. We've seen the role it ha has played in tracking down things like uh, racist comments, tracking down things like problematic behavior of celebra celebrities or renowned personalities, and putting them out there for judgment. So previously, perhaps this could be hidden a lot more. Uh, it could have been shied away from a lot more. But social media uh, is something that is vigilant and is, is a world where people can call you out. And this also means that. Uh, on an everyday grassroots level as well. People who encounter problematic behaviors from other people who can now uh, put up a status about that person's behavior on social media and really create a discussion and that discussion can propel action. So call out culture, definitely it owes its existence to social media and has proven to be a really strong tool and a very important element for society in the days to come. But as people have adapted to expression, 
so did they to things they so did those uh, who are being expressed against. Uh, so I'll, it benefits a lot of people to take down the callouts that are happening. It benefits a lot of people to make sure uh, that they are emerging the winners in these social media wars. And they use a lot of techniques to do this. So let's go over a few. The first one is, of course, straw manning, which is something debaters are familiar with. But it's very common in social media to have your original argument uh, taken away and replaced by something else. So uh, they end up really misquoting you. They end up citing something else and arguing against that particular thing. And, be, and they pile on and on and on onto you, right? So the, or it's, it's really likely that uh, the original point or the original argument is lost in that sense. Secondly, personal attacks. Uh, social media is, of course, a world full of anger. And we often see that if a, if a personality expresses an opinion and a particular group of people don't like that opinion, uh, instead of the reality, instead of the way we talk about it in debates, which is person A says something, group B has a different point and a debate begins. Before the debate really kicks in, what's more common is personal attacks come in. Uh, people are insulted based on their race, their appearance, their affiliations, and really made to feel bad. And this is done in a coordinated way to make sure you're not as outspoken on social media in days to come. Uh, this, is all, this can also manifest itself in things like doxing, where, you're, where your accounts are hacked at mass uh, and manipulated by these groups. So there is, a, there is a lot of nastiness that exists there. Uh, this is also exists in the form of image manipulation or deep fakes. Most recently, we've seen even Donald Trump has retweeted uh, a fake video of Joe Biden where it has been altered uh, to make it seem like his speech is slurred and he's drunk. And he's retweeted this and his followers have piled on. So the point of origin is something these people always try to remove right away and establish a new point of origin in which they rally behind and they continue to proliferate. Uh, what this contributes to is tactically derailing platforms, tactically derailing uh, attempts at good discourse and trying to destroy the original discussion instead of making sure a fruitful outcome is reached. So of course it benefits these people to make sure that discourse doesn't happen, but it also benefits all these platforms who continue to have these emotional uh, invested interactions and engagement in their platforms and websites and so on and so forth. Uh, another common is, of course, another uh, outcome that happens as a result of this is we see original narratives are hijacked and we see a lot of manufactured pandering. Uh, because you have a social media persona to maintain, uh, you really try to cater uh, to uh, the populist populists within social media. And oftentimes, this really is widely different from what a person actually is like or what a uh, system actually is like. So people are pandering to what they think will do well on social media and what will get the most reactions rather than molding their policies based on more practical outcomes. And this means that a lot of discussion that happens on social media uh, skips over a lot of practical discussion, a lot of policy level discussion, and is geared to be more populist and geared towards being more toxic interactions rather than anything fruitful. Um, this, of course, has led to um, the entire process of social media discussion being very exhausting and has resulted in some tangible harms that I feel can come up in a variety of debates. Um, the first one is the idea of slacktivism, where activism on social media is now such an exhausting process because you don't just have to make your content and express it. You have to defend it each and every second, oftentimes against really toxic, coordinated efforts to take you down. And that really means that if so much of your energy is spent behind just putting the message out there, your second and third activities, which would perhaps have reinforced that messages or created tangible physical outcomes of those messages, are less likely to happen. So people are become, being more outspoken on social media, but the points Bs and Cs after those con that content is generated and how that manifests itself in the real world is often something people are struggling to reach because there's a huge impasse of the social media discussion itself being so dominant and so exhausting and such a long process that you stay stuck there and don't move beyond that. And that hurts the ability of you to be a, uh, to be a more rounded activist. And for uh, 
activities to gain traction. Secondly, of course, is the issue of performative activism, which ties back to manufactured pandering, which we spoke about earlier as well, where people are establishing themselves as uh, more tolerant, uh, establishing themselves as being very charitable. They're doing things like uh, going out and interacting with poor people and putting that up on Facebook Live and people are thinking that well, this is a wonderful person. But then if you look at their policies, you will see that the very neighborhood they're taking all these nice photo op, op, photo op sessions in are areas which they've defunded or which areas they've hurt. Recently, we had a massive social media campaign for, called the Clap for NHS, NHS in the UK. And, but if you dig down, you will see that the NHS has been constantly been defunded by the very politicians who hail these healthcare workers as heroes in the first place. So it's a performance they're putting on to convince people that you know they're great or that things are okay, but in reality, uh, this is overriding and creating a false picture and preventing people from going beyond this and looking into what actions these people have actually done. Thirdly, of course, is the idea of echo chambers. Because uh, social media is so exhausting, because obviously no one wants to spend each and every day or has the capacity to spend each and every day fighting back against, uh, against things they don't like, People tend to design their news feeds and friend lists in such a way that it reflects the opinions they share and it creates a sort of culture where people reinforce the things you say. So you create a news feed where more people are more liberal and less conservative. And what that ultimately does, it creates these bubbles. So really you're screaming into a void and you're saying all of these things, uh, but it's reaching only the base you've already convinced and not necessarily the base you need to convince in the first place. Uh, and that often leads to the discourse not materializing even though we think we have generated the discourse. In, uh, in its efforts to control all of these discussions, censorship has become a pivotal arena for debate. But a problem that results is that the censorship is often done without nuance because a lot of the censorship is automated. It's done by bots, or it's done by people, who, uh, a large groups of outsourced workers who have specific instructions of things that are an absolute no-no to community standards and must be taken off. What that does is it results in censorship not being very nuanced. Uh, a key example recently is Shaun King, who is the author of the Son of Baldwin page on Facebook, which is very outspoken about discrimination the African-American community faces. So recently, because he used the word nigger in his content, uh, we found it was found that his entire page was taken down, uh, which is incorrect because this is a page that vouches for these people rather than tries to oppress them. But because of that word being present and deemed inflammatory, the entire page got taken down. So there's not a lot of nuance or not a lot of thought uh, put into not a lot of thought put into what's being censored, which means it's easier to go around and at times a uh, random stumbling block that you end up engaging with because uh, you somehow violated a community standard. So there's significant improvement needed here. Um, the failings of Facebook and Twitter to control such behavior has led to mobilization happening more on networks like FireChat, which is very commonly used in the Hong Kong protests, or Telegram, uh, which is sort of a more personal encrypted messenger. Uh, while this gives you more easier and cleaner conversation, uh, this happens at the cost of eyeballs. But uh, this is a huge arena for debate itself that maybe it's best to mitigate a world where social prestige seems to take precedence over the social output itself. So building of your social prestige and persona versus the actual social output, discourse and conversation and mobilization can generate is the biggest um, arena for social media debates. And it's very important for us to always stay updated and see how these conversations play out and what social media is actually creating in terms of tangible output and whether that output is worth lauding and celebrating in the first place and what has led to that output succeeding or failing. It's very important to always know these things and study the protests and galvanizations that are happening to make sure we can stay relevant in these sort of debates. Uh, of course, social media is still a valuable tool for these sort of things because of the huge amount of following that you can generate, it is a platform which, through which you can create critical mass. Uh, just as uh, more conservative uh, sources are becoming tech savvy, 
so are social justice warriors and more liberal sources as well. Uh, they are trying their best to become tech savvy and ensure impactful call out can be done. And another really important thing about social media and an important characterization of social media is that it's an equalizer. Uh, it allows someone to make uh, their brand and make their personality or brand from the comfort of their home. Uh, and that's really important because you can appeal to your, to your crowds with relatable content. Uh, one of the best examples of this is Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or AOC, the youngest congresswoman in the United States. And she's really risen to popularity because of her strong social media presence, because people are relating to her, people are getting a glimpse into her life. And what has, this has allowed us to do, it allowed her to do is build a strong fan following. And at the same time, overcome limitations she would have faced in a world without social media. So for example, previously in a world without social media, uh, your ability to canvas and go door to door, uh, your ability to go to multiple areas, your ability to have a marketing budget, your ability to leverage virality, all of these things were significantly lopsided. Uh, few people could do it, uh, but majority could not. But now more people, regardless of whether the quality of their campaigning is good or bad, can come in and actually campaign in the first place. So it has really uh, equalized a lot of these things. Uh, so what we've gathered from this discussion is the characterization of discourse and narrative building and how things spill over in social media. This is always a really important facet to have in any debates where we're uh, discussing protests and we're discussing how discourse can play out. So the next time someone says they're going to generate discourse, you don't have to accept it at face value. You can go in and characterize what that discourse looks like and question whether it's worth having at all. Uh, next, let's move on to the arena of political ads and fake news. And this has really been just such a dominant part of our life these days. And uh, I'm sure all of us see it. All of us see Donald Trump tweeted. All of us see our parents and grandparents spreading things through WhatsApp and believing whatever they read on the internet. It has become really difficult to deal with. But this is something politicians have successfully weaponized and made a huge part um, of, their, of their existence. Um, there's an article out there uh, on, I believe, The Atlantic, which talks about how political misinformation is the ultimate weapon for all elections going forward. And I strongly recommend everyone to read it. Uh, so some mind-boggling stats, really. Um, you know, uh, in the UK, uh, there is a limit to how much you can spend within your constituency on campaigning uh, for your political cause. The cap is around 30,000 pounds. Within just the last year alone, two million pounds have been spent on digital ads. So imagine how they've bypassed that cap by focusing on digital advertising. Uh, in the US, where it's a lot more prevalent, it's around 81 million pounds. Um, and there's no accountability of how much money each person is spending. There's no, uh, there's no transparent capping being done for any of this. Facebook at one point started maintaining a log of campaign spending. And people really appreciated this and thought that this is the beginning of transparent political campaigning on social media. Uh, but that, in, that log uh, started having a lot of data go mysteriously missing, which again, brings, which again brought forth a lot of discussion on whether uh, the social media platforms have the correct intention when it comes to policing political content. Um, so it sounds bad, right? It sounds bad that um, they are spending way beyond the cap they're supposed to have just by going onto digital and the platform they're doing it in is more than happy to reward the incitement these people are pursuing. Um, it sounds bad, but it's actually worse. So let's discuss the sort of uh, techniques that are regularly and commonly used. Uh, I think what this part will allow you to do is talk about specific ways these campaigns and political ads function instead of just uh, saying fake news is bad. Uh, of course, uh, it is bad, but judges always expect more analysis of why uh, it is so bad. Why is it that we must clamp down on political campaigning or spending on Facebook? So here are some examples. Uh, number one is shadow campaigns. So what is a shadow campaign? A shadow campaign uh, is a thought process within which uh, 
politicians have, uh, have put out a preemptive effort to fight off regulation. What that means is, uh, even if Facebook comes up and says that, okay, you uh, as a politician cannot spend more than uh, $30,000 on ads, uh, they will say, okay, they'll hold their hands up and accept. But there's a massive loophole here, wherein which the political party uh, has the cap placed on them. But social media is not just open to political parties, it's open to the entire world. So they have full leeway to encourage people to campaign on their behalf instead. So in the UK last year, a platform called Capitalized Worker, a Facebook page, became immensely popular. They spent over five to eight million pounds on social media. So just imagine a random Facebook page spending that much money. Uh, you don't, if you put two and two together, you can guess where that money has come from because all of their content targeted Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party and constantly went against all of their policies. So uh, shadow campaigning is where you encourage different people to campaign on your behalf and they end up spending a significant amount of money on social media as well to bypass future regulations on social media spending that came in. Another uh, really popular strategy which right-wing politicians have used to great effect all across the world is the dead cat strategy. The dead cat strategy um, origins in the story that two people go for a meeting, a meeting about a very serious issue. Uh, the person who is the investigated person of this meeting throws a dead cat onto the table. And immediately you shift your attention from the original purpose of that meeting to the freaking dead cat on your table. Uh, the best example of this uh, playing out in terms of social media politics is uh, Trump versus Biden in recent times. Just as things were picking up in Twitter and in Facebook about Trump's uh, perceived illegal ties to Ukraine, where he was pressuring Ukrainian political officials to suit his agenda, uh, Joe Biden in particular was very outspoken about this, really pushing for impeachment to take place. Just around the same time, Trump party leaks a story of Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, also having significant political ties to Ukraine, as Trump was accused of having as well. So suddenly, whether we should have an impeachment, how that impeachment process looks like, who are the people involved in the impeachment process, uh, what happens if an impeachment does take place, all of that discussion is replaced by, does Hunter Biden have ties with Ukraine? Who is Hunter Biden? Three things you didn't know about the Biden family. This is the content that takes and canvases all over social media and replaces the original conversation we were supposed to have at this time. It's a very common tactic that is being pursued by governments and parties all and organizations all over the world to detract away whenever they feel they're about to be called out on something. That's a key opponent of call out culture. Uh, thirdly is the trust me concept. The trust me concept is when political uh, organizations or pages affiliated with or personalities affiliated with politics position themselves in social media as a trusted source. Uh, so what, what this is also a preemptive move and another uh, example of certain uh, organizations being a lot more mobilized and forward thinking in terms of how social media can be leveraged. So in the time of Brexit, uh, pro-Brexit uh, pages realized that uh, misinformation is being called out a lot more. But misinformation was a key weapon for them. So what one of these pages did is it renamed itself to Fact Check UK uh, during a political debate that was taking place. When a debate takes place uh, on live TV, more people tend to come in uh, to listen. And Fact Check UK started trending on all key social media platforms like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere. Because as people were watching the debates, as outlandish claims were being made, they came in to fact check it. Usually the normal pages that do the fact checking would have taken precedence at this time. But this is a page that previously was posting insightful content, uh, was previously garnering a lot of mass following through its usual propaganda, renamed itself to Fact Check UK and started acting as the fact checker. And this is something people thought were reliable because it, because it was named Fact Checker UK. It just seemed like such a harmless, informative website. So what is a non-neutral platform became perceived as a neutral fact-checking point of reference and succeeded in weaponizing misinformation during a very crucial time of a live debate. Uh, fourthly is uh, bots. 
Uh, so this has really taken in popularity, especially after the 2016 election, where foreign parties get involved in localized politics. Uh, and they do this through automated profiles, uh, which are not real people, but actually uh, automated tech bots, which are performing actions they're coded to do. They resemble real life profiles, though crude in nature. It's really hard to deal with uh, them because they create these in bulk quantities. They create these in hundreds and thousands and millions. Uh, these are coordinated through uh, shady offices and sometimes not so shady offices across the world. So it is completely possible for a Russian politician to set up a click farm run by impoverished Bangladeshi people who are functioning as those bots. Or at the same time, they can uh, go on a much simpler route of creating tech bots themselves and putting them out there uh, to do a particular agenda. Uh, so during uh, Brexit, we started having a lot of profiles called doctors for Brexit uh, to, sh to in convince people that intellectual doctors and healthcare workers of the NHS were behind Brexit. Um, at the same time, during the Trump and Clinton election, we saw Russian bots really get involved in each and every poll, each and every discussion, and they really influenced the discourse that took place. Uh, the leak of Hillary Clinton's emails, which dominated discussion over anything else that happened, was primarily driven by these sort of bots. So they play a crucial role in manipulating polls that take place online or in spreading disinformation and a very difficult weapon to deal with. Uh, a fifth tactic that is commonly used is ungoverned videos. What do I mean by ungoverned videos? See, you can't say everything on TV because there are certain watchdogs and policies that television channels and media organizations have built, uh, which the government also enforces. So your ability to do inflammatory rhetoric on TV is significantly limited. But these restrictions don't exist on things like Facebook Live or Instagram Live, which have just become synonymous to TV broadcast really these days because we're consuming so much uh, content through social media. Uh, it has become common for politicians or uh, personalities to go live on Facebook and give a speech there uh, and things like that. Uh, but they can do whatever they want in these, uh, in these uh, sort of sessions. They can say whatever they want. Uh, no one can really stop them from doing anything. Uh, the Democrats actually pursued a bill in which Facebook live sessions or Instagram live sessions would have to conform to the same rules that uh, the likes of you giving a speech on BBC or content on TV has to follow as well. But of course, to no surprise, that bill was blocked by the Republican Party who overwhelmingly voted against it. It's a key tool that is maintained uh, to make sure that you can say whatever you want, whenever you want, just by clicking the live button and putting your message out there. Uh, the next thing uh, is the idea of, uh, is an idea that really destroys the concept of discourse. Uh, one of the main things that is cited as the benefit of discourse is the idea of the marketplace, a marketplace of ideas where, convert, uh, where con divergent points intersect and converge to create a middle ground. Uh, but people who don't want that discourse, who don't want that middle ground, now have the ability to simply bypass it. Uh, this is called A-B testing, and it's similar to the click-through rate experiment I spoke about earlier. Uh, but let's discuss this in more detail. What does A-B testing mean? A-B testing means that you can pull out content and you can put out different contents at once. So you can create sets, one set for an African-American demographic, one set for a Middle Eastern demographic, and each set can have different content. So this means that uh, instead of engaging a discussion of whether African-American community feels safe under Trump presidency, uh, they will instead pull out, push out content like, um, like a content saying that Bernie Sanders has always failed the African-American community. Uh, or by pulling out or putting out a rumor uh, that uh, African-American community will be targeted for violence if they go out to vote. See, under normal circumstances, if they posted this, you would see it uh, as someone who is a neutral guardian of the internet or someone who is incited by this comment. And you would call it out, right? Uh, you would also share it or maybe even alert law enforcement or alert anyone about how bad this is. 
But in a world where you're micro, it's micro-targeted and it's A-B tested among a specific group, you're not even seeing it. So the only person seeing it uh, is the group that's targeted. So only members of the African-American community that is being micro-targeted is seeing this content. So through this, they can do things like voter suppression. They can do things like uh, target or tampering of community, community's mindset. So instead of entering a world where discussions take place, where many groups come in under one umbrella and have a discussion, it's possible to bypass all of that altogether and reach out to different little subgroups and tinker with them accordingly. All of these techniques come together to create one finishing move, which is drowning out through noise. Uh, this is a popular technique specifically developed by Mr. Steve Bannon, uh, who was you know, really in charge of Trump's communications during his successful election. He's the founder of Breitbart, a very inflammatory right-wing website. And the philosophy, which he talks so proudly about, is simply putting so much content out there that other content gets harder to find. Uh, so the Trump campaign put out 5.7 million varieties of ads, bots, deep fakes, unregistered native news sites. Uh, so for example, something like uh, the Ohio Times, which sounds like it's a news site, but it's really just a website being maintained by uh, staffers. Uh, all of these things, emails and so many different ways and techniques and varieties of it, creates a world uh, where there's so much distorted news out there that even if you're media literate, even if you're tech savvy, uh, you start wondering and reflexively questioning every headline because it's not necessarily that you have to believe that these contents are telling the truth. It's just that in a state of where your suspicions are heightened, the truth itself about what's happening with Trump in Ukraine, what impeachment looks like, what are Hillary's policies and takes and responses, all of these things are just more difficult to locate because you're swimming through swarms of content, all created to make sure you are pulled further and further away from the good discourse or the truth you're supposed to see in the first place. With each swipe that you do on a social media screen, the notion of observable reality drifts further and further out of reach. And that becomes very toxic and it makes people question themselves less and accept this as a norm. And that is something, especially over the last four years, has really happened. Um, Let's talk about two case studies uh, of this. Uh, one, of course, I just discussed is the Trump re-election, uh, where he successfully just swarmed the internet and made sure the opposing content didn't even come up. And even if it did, it stayed within a certain group and didn't go beyond that. But it's not just limited to the West. Uh, this sort of uh, techniques are also being performed by demagogues across the world, um, and in many different ways as well. The root of all of this uh, the root concept of all of this is manipulating groups with particular information that incites a reaction you want and swarms out the ability for countering opinions to come in. Uh, another case study comes from the Philippines. Uh, Rodrigo Duterte is the current president of the Philippines and he has become really notorious for his war on drugs, where millions of people have been killed uh, under the justification that the Filipino government is pursuing a war on drugs. Uh, so see, before you carry out a policy as drastic as um, open killing of people involved with the drug trade, uh, you need to build up a grassroots support of it. You need to really make it feel like this is the calling of the people. So how did Duterte manufacture this using social media? He took inspiration from an experiment called the Little Albert Experiment, where a child is taught to fear furry animals by hearing loud noises every time he encounters one. So his social media team, Duterte's social media team, started creating little Facebook groups. Uh, Facebook groups of a particular area, of a locality, of a sports team. And they spent time growing these groups. And some of these groups grew to have like, let's say 100,000 people or 200,000 people. Once they got big, they started having a lot of people come in and post in these localized groups about a murder that has taken place in the area, a theft that has taken place in the area, and then, just as this news has been posted, somebody would come in and comment about how they've heard in their locality or through the grapevine that this was drug related. So each and every news about a death, about a murder, about an offense of any sort, suddenly started getting linked to drugs very effectively by what seemed like large swaths of people 
in groups that didn't seem all that political. You've come in, you've come into a group, uh, let's say about a sports team, which has lots of people and which where you're used to having non-political conversation, all of a sudden someone posts a shocking content there and seemingly neutral people start commenting about how they know it's related to drugs, makes, it messes with your mind. And you think that, okay, there is something to making sure that there's a massive drug problem and it needs to be dealt with. So uh, this is something that was successfully mobilized by Duterte in his drug war uh, and is a case study that has been repeated over and over again. Uh, the above techniques uh, aren't just limited to winning elections or passing policies. They can have really horrific consequences on a grassroots level. Um, in a continent, subcontinent like South Asia, rumors on platforms like WhatsApp have led to horrific things like lynching of people because they're perceived to be against a particular religion. Uh, in Bangladesh, we had the infamous uh, killing in Ramu, where someone was perceived to have published inflammatory content uh, against Islam and was killed uh, by a mob, uh, lynched by a mob uh, because uh, they believed that that particular rumor was true. Uh, violent political outfits have really realized that this doesn't necessarily need to be an isolated incident anymore. They have started creating thousands and hundreds of Ramos all over the world and has really become a coordinated uh, effort. Um, there's a fascinating article on The Wired uh, about um, the RSS, which is Narendra Modi's uh, really youth wing in the first place, who are extremely militarized, about how they reach out to uh, a lot of, let's say, angsty, unemployed youth, form them as a coalition under one of their political outfits, and really have them policing Twitter, uh, policing these, uh, uh, this war on misinformation, policing communities, and observing each and everything and acting accordingly. Uh, so uh, what, what this results in is a coordinated effort to spread misinformation and use that misinformation as a justification for clamping down on a minority group and this can lead to horrific consequences. And this is becoming really common in the South Asian subcontinent. Uh, the third thing uh, that the above techniques we discuss lead to is the rise of shocking personalities. Uh, as we discussed earlier, moral assertions uh, or emotional statements, uh, these really incite reactions and engagement to your content. So the likes of Ben Shapiro or Alex Jones, uh, th through Facebook Live and through YouTube, they've really become personalities. These are people who commonly would not have a platform or would not be invited into mainstream discourse, but they've become household names. Uh, the fact that so many of these people are quickly becoming household names is no coincidence. It's because YouTube uh, uses an algorithm called the catch and hold method, uh, where they see a user and the moment they click on an Alex Jones content, YouTube wants to hold on to this user. And then they'll use something like a, what they'll do is they'll make sure you see someone just like Alex Jones. So now you're not exposed to just one Alex Jones, you're exposed to a world of them. And YouTube rewards you and you feel rewarded when you keep discovering this sort of content. So you go down a rabbit hole of such content, which really messes on a day to day basis with how you think. And this is a key tool for indoctrination of politics and religion uh, pursued by so many people. We've seen the likes of Dr. Zakir Naik as well and how he leveraged such a concept to really convince people to think in terms of his version of reality. So shocking personalities using the catch and hold method are on the rise in terms of indoctrinating people by taking them down the YouTube rabbit hole. The next thing is the flow model. Uh, this is quite fascinating because uh, see what the flow model does is it works to build a loyal following. How so? Uh, so this is a bit different from Facebook. Uh, this is platforms like 4chan or platforms like Reddit. What they do is they build a, a cult of people who feel they're in the know. So they won't put out an article or they won't put out an elaborate video. They'll put out vague statements that makes you question. For example, who's governing you? Who's watching you? Where, where are we headed to? These are vague statements that invite a lot of open-ended discussion and also invite and create a sense of mystery. So it's like a code and people always want to find out what a code leads to, right? 
So this helps create like conspiracy theories and creates a really fervent base who feels they know more than other people. So they become more tribal. Uh, tribalism increases. They become more dismissive of mainstream media or intellectual crowds, and they feel unique. And they feel and they feel that their uniqueness is rewarded through the use of flow model. Um, two examples I would like you to look up is PizzaGate and QAnon. These are two conspiracy theories that have been built using the flow model and are rumored to have been originated by people working uh, under Steve Bannon at the time of the Trump campaign. Both of these conspiracy theories to this day, four years later, have a huge fervent fan following who maintain this is the absolute truth and are dismissive of anything else. So in terms of building uh, or really reinforcing urban legends and conspiracy theories, social media can be a potentially sick tool. Uh, so all of that makes it sound kind of helpless, but when motivated, tech giants can act and can regulate. Uh, the coronavirus, which we're currently all suffering from, uh, ha is also triggered a lot by misinformation. There's a lot of misinformation going on about it. Did it originate in a lab in Wuhan? Is a vaccine coming out tomorrow? And people are suffering from misinformation amidst this time of panic. But if you look at Facebook and Twitter, what they're doing is they're nudging people whenever they post a content that's misinformed, and they're telling them to go check out a Wu, Wu uh, wow, I just said Wu, I meant Who. Yeah, they're telling people to go check out the World Health Organization website. Uh, so proactively, they're looking at articles and content which, are, which carry misinformation and are striking them down and telling people to go to more authentic sources instead. Uh, at the same time, Twitter uh, has taken a stance against deep fakes and altered audio by giving a tag of altered every time someone posts an uh, edited video. Uh, because uh, in a platform like Twitter, uh, edited videos are a huge problem and it has been weaponized as well as we discussed above as well. So social media and tech giants can act. See, deep fakes uh, have a lot of, can put on a lot of harm to users beyond politics. Uh, the coronavirus is a non-politized uh, event as well. Uh, but tech giants seem to actively be shying away from policing politics and policing political campaigns and personalities, even though they seem to have the ability to do so. This is a massive scope for debate and discussion uh, going forward and needs to be really studied and followed to see what are the remaining steps that they can take and why are they not taking them already when they've shown that in the events of uh, protecting general users or in the events of a non-political event, they do seem to have the ability to quickly step in and mobilize effectively. So why are they not doing this for politics and political campaigns? It's a massive question to answer. Uh, that sort of summarizes the political aspect of the discussion, but I just want to spend some time on some basics, which we sometimes take for granted. Uh, and what I want to talk about is the basics of targeting. Uh, so targeting is something uh, we simplify really sometimes. We say that, oh, our data is taken and we are targeted, but let's talk about how that actually happens. So you've seen the cook pop up. This site uses cookies to improve your experience. Please accept cookies. Uh, so this is an important part of this debate uh, about whether targeted advertising is good or not, because these cookies, as they're called, do significantly improve your experience. They function as a website's short-term memory. Uh, with each new click you make, the cookies can identify you as the same person. So in a world where these cookies did not exist, every time you add something to your cart, uh, it would go away. Or uh, every time you go to a website, it would ask you to log in all over again. Uh, so it really becomes a more cumbersome internet in a world where cookies do not exist. Uh, the main purpose of a cookie is to identify users and prepare customized web pages. Uh, uh, and what that means is in a world without cookies, a web server would have no memory of you. So the personalized internet that you enjoy, uh, the personalized feeds that you enjoy, the music recommendations you get, uh, these would all suffer uh, in a world without cookies and create a more cumbersome and not as rewarding internet experience for you. The problem that comes in is that there are two types of cookies. There are first party cookies, uh, which are critical to the website's function, but there are third party cookies, which are primarily proliferated by ad tech companies and social media companies who don't stop functioning 
at that, uh, just at that website, they follow you, they latch onto you and they follow you around the web. They observe your behavior uh, and they break that behavior down into data sets and feed that back to advertisers who can then target you with ads which they deem relevant to you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is where it becomes really invasive uh, this, is, this, is also, this is also extremely uh, problematic because it has created a world where all advertisers are super hungry for data and they'll do whatever uh, it takes to get that data. So the harm doesn't just stop in third party cookies, it sort of begins. Uh, it creates a world where advertisers are rewarded for knowing you the best. Uh, so they not only just follow you around the internet and study your behavior, they'll pull out a lot of tricks to make sure you keep feeding them data. One of the most common things is little games on uh, Facebook or little pop-up ads which uh, have like a quiz on them, which you play. Uh, but in the process of playing, you give out information. This is something Cambridge Analytica uh, mastered and really took away a lot of user data as we heard, which was the sort of turning point to pull Facebook to Congress, though not a lot resulted from that. Uh, and it's not, it's not just limited to these little quizzes. But it's important to also study and see that um, every app you download, uh, every game you play, all of them do take certain permissions from you, from what you do on your mobile phone. And it's important to see what permissions you're giving because there are a lot of apps and products which will even take permission of recording you. And that's why sometimes you'll talk about something, uh, then you'll go home or you'll look on your phone and you'll see an ad related to whatever you talked about even though it's not something you necessarily put out into your social space on the internet. So there's a gross violation of privacy happening and there's a gross analysis of your habits taking place. Uh, and this is a huge arena for debate uh, in terms of how we're treating these things going forward. Uh, the last two things I will sort of talk about is uh, throughout this uh, session, we've covered behavior on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, but there's a new social that's kicking in and I think as more people are becoming fatigued by the mainstream social media sites, a lot of people aggressively are turning to newer and more radically different social media sites. TikTok is the most popular one right now. Um, millions of users, super engaged. Uh, in surface seems harmless because it's people singing, dancing, and making uh, questionable jokes. Um, but becoming TikTok famous, now seems to be like a popular goal for high schoolers. Uh, and that means that the legion of TikTok users that are there are underage. And this has landed the company in hot water on several occasions. Uh, it has been fined for collecting data from children, the cookies we spoke about earlier. Uh, it had, because it's also a Chinese made giant product, it's censoring pro Hong Kong videos, banning LGBTQ content in countries like Tur Turkey and India and facing an investigation uh, if the app poses a threat to Western citizens because of its Chinese proliferation. Uh, and fun story here is that Mark Zuckerberg is not happy about this. He's, he even has tried to make a copycat of TikTok called Lasso, but it just hasn't generated popularity. He's also tried to buy it multiple times. And he's not wrong when it comes to identifying social media trends and what can possibly potentially be a social media giant. So TikTok is well on its way to uh, potentially dominating our lives. And we might see lots of debates centered around what sort of behavior is appropriate there, or also the potential, the future politicization of it, because it will happen. And of course, uh, it's Chinese origins. Uh, these are very important. Um, secondly, we talked a bit earlier about uh, websites like 4chan, which are more tribal in nature. Uh, there are many sites like this. So let's just do a quick uh, look into what are the sort of things these uh, sites do. Uh, see, their culture is intricate and ever evolving, and it thrives on not being easy to understand. It's very different from the usual discussion on social media, and they thrive on having alternative opinions and will do whatever it takes to assert these as the truth. Um, they pursue a lot of uh, activities to have fun, but often at times when weaponized at large scale, this can have drastic consequences. Uh, they do things like poll hacking. Um, so, you know, they'll go to a Time magazine poll about personality of the year and just vote for someone random. Uh, but it's so massively coordinated that they actually can win a poll that the entire world is voting on. So imagine how mobilized they are. 
Now apply this to a political setting or weaponization by a radical party, and you can see that it can have disastrous consequences. Uh, they have tried to make things trend on Google searches like swastika or the phrase lol niggers. Uh, so again, a huge ground for toxic incitement. Uh, news hoaxes, uh, the death of people, uh, fake news about certain things someone have done like Apple stocks pl uh, plummeting or someone uh, you know, just doing a horrible thing. And uh, these hoaxes become viral as well. Email hacks, notable targets, um, celebrities. Uh, la a few years back, we had a massive scandal where personal photos of major celebrities were leaked. Uh, this included, you know, uh, photos of a sexual and nude nature, uh, which were definitely not for public consumption, but hacked by these people and put out. Uh, so it's a very unmoderated space where misogyny and racism and political stances are always on hyperdrive. And there's a lot of problems in these communities. And uh, it's difficult to police them because their worldview through continued presence in these interactions is drastically different from any form of mainstream governance or community standard. Um, Reddit recently took a massive step to govern such behavior. Uh, so Reddit, which is also a platform which is very uh, conversation centric and has a loyal base of communities, a community driven uh, approach, as opposed to Facebook which is a more public driven approach. So Reddit recently banned a lot of these toxic uh, subreddits as they're called, which is where the conversations take place on particular topics. So they remove the groups which are dedicated to fat shaming, groups uh, dedicated to incels. Uh, and it has actually turned out, uh, after it was studied, uh, the outcome of these removals, it was proven that these people actually then went on to leave the platform. Yeah, sure, they went on to alternative platforms uh, that are also out there. But that means you're pushing them further and further down uh, away from uh, infecting a lot more people. And it also means you're making our current platform more open to less toxic discussion. So there is, again, another, it's again another science suggesting that if governance and moderation is taken by the tech giant or the platform in question, it is possible to generate uh, good results. And it is, put, it is possible to make the arena cleaner so that discourse in its true essence can take place. But the more we ignore this, the more these sort of abilities to derail discourse levels up and can be politicized and weaponized, not just by politicians and campaigners, but by a lot of dangerous people to create dangerous outcomes. That's why social media is no longer a light debate topic. It is a prevalent part of our lives and the future hotbed for politics, for mobilization, and potentially for a, a mobilized oppression as well. So it's very important for us to know the inner workings of what motivates people on social media, what their conversation looks like, and the owners of these platforms themselves, what are their motivations, their intentions, and how can we uh, as a world hold them accountable to make sure the proper moderation takes place. So social media is something that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why I would encourage you all uh, to follow what's happening on these platforms and maintain your own notes and case studies of things you're observing on social media. Uh, platforms like Vox through their blog Recode there's a fantastic summary of what's happening in the world of social media. So this is thing, something definitely we all need to keep an eye on. Uh, I hope you've learned something from these sessions. Uh, what I aim to do was really characterize the workings and motivations and techniques that are used within social media. So you can apply this to the debate knowledge you already have. And now your debates on social media no longer have to uh, be limited to buzzwords or phrases, but has a layer of paint that you can add on to that. And I hope that will help you have clearer and more intense debates and also create a circuit for us where we can see more livelier and informed debates on social media, which we can all learn from. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.